Well, hello and welcome everybody to ICMDA webinars. Uh, I'm Dr. Peter Saunders, the Chief Executive of the ICMDA and the ICMDA, the International Christian Medical and Dental Association brings together over 80 national groups of Christian doctors and dentists throughout the world. This is number 36 in our webinar series. And today we're privileged to have Dr. Richard Winter speaking to us on the subject of coping with anxiety in a dangerous world and what could be more relevant uh, at this time than that. Richard grew up in England. He trained in medicine at St. Bartholomew's Hospital London and then in psychiatry in Bristol in the UK. He's a past member of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in the UK. He was also a counsellor, a teacher and a leader at the English Labrie. Uh, and associate pastor of a church in Hampshire for some years before moving to the United States in 1992, where he headed up the counseling program at Covenant Seminary, where he's now Professor Emeritus. And Dr. Winter's research interests have been at the interface of psychology, medicine, and theology. He's the author of several books, which include The Roots of Sorrow, Reflections on Depression and Hope, Still Bored in a Culture of Entertainment, Rediscovering Passion and Wonder, uh, Perfecting Ourselves to Death, The Pursuit of Excellence and the Perils of Perfectionism, and When Life Goes Dark, Finding Hope in the Midst of Depression. He continues to practice therapy privately and with the Global Counseling Network. So uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Winter. It's wonderful to have you on ICMDA webinars. So um, it's good to be with you this afternoon talking about this topic. It was interesting just in the last few days has been a time in my own life, the last few weeks of particular anxiety as we have been moving from the United States to England, back to England again, uh, and looking for houses and cars and all the other things and trying to sell our apartment in the States. So my anxiety level has been particularly high. And so I'm speaking to myself as I speak to you today. Um, and uh, I went for a walk today and um, was thinking about a lot of these themes as I walked. And my first question, I guess, is, is how do you experience anxiety? Many of us experience it in the thoughts that go round and round in, my head, in our heads, uh, either in the day or particularly maybe in the early hours of the morning when you get obsessed with all the things that you you have to do or are afraid of. We also feel anxiety in our bodies. Um, you know, we don't, we not only have our brains in our heads, but our bodies, our brains extend into other brains in our gut, in our heart. Um, and the vagus nerve, as many of you know, uh, is a huge nerve that carries a lot of the connections between these things. I tend to feel my anxiety mostly, I think, in my gut and my shoulders. Others feel it more in their chest. They get, they get tight chested. Uh, others feel it in other parts of, of, of their bodies. So what I'm going to do today is to uh, reflect on the experience of anxiety, to reflect on some of the biblical themes around anxiety. It's going to be a sort of bird's eye view approach to this inevitably with the time we've got, and then to look at what I've called common grace remedies for anxiety, which come out of the therapy world and the medical world, some very simple, but many of them fit very well within a, a Christian worldview, a Christian framework. But one of the things that, as, as I was experiencing this anxiety today, I was telling myself, you shouldn't be anxious. You should have more faith. Trust God. Why are you feeling so anxious? And why are you feeling ashamed that you're anxious and you're reluctant to tell other people? And I think it's partly because we have these sort of categorical statements in scripture. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. Have no anxiety about anything. And of course, these statements have to be seen in the context of the whole Bible and the whole of our lives, because it's not, as, we, as most of us know, not just quite as simple as that. And by the way, the, these, the, all that I'm giving you on the slide is available in the notes that you should be able to access, um, and, and more than I'm giving you on the slides, actually, so that should be helpful to you. But, but to ask ourselves, what makes us worried, typically anxious? What triggers anxiety for you? 
And in this particular time, of course, we're all triggered by the, the fear of the virus. We're all getting into obsessive washing, rightly so, um, and, uh, and obsessive worrying about it. Um, and rightly fearing, as we see the statistics, that some of us, especially the more elderly in my age group, may indeed be, be uh, actually killed by this virus. But there are many other things in the news, the starvation in some countries, the job losses, the, the, the wars and the effects of wars on people, the climate change, um, the economic anxieties that are resulting from COVID. Um, many things like this that, that give us cause for worry. And then the more ordinary worries from day to day about our children, about our elderly relatives, or um, about having enough, enough money and food to get by each day. So as we think of anxiety, and, and I'm using the word anxiety, I guess you could think of worry, fear, they're all in that same category. Um, we can think of healthy anxiety and fear. So if I walk out into the street and a bus or a truck is coming towards me, I need to feel anxiety. I need to run, get out of the way. It's no good if I just freeze in the middle of the street. So there is, there is a, a healthy response to anxiety, whether it's you know, anxiety before an exam, forcing you to revise for that exam. Um, so we, we have the typical physiological reactions of fight, flight, or freeze. And all of those can be adaptive in the animal kingdom. Obviously freezing, an animal just going absolutely still and looking as if it's dead has a protective function for it. Um, so we all experience these, and but then we, we also experience too much of them. So we may get into fights which are dangerous. We may run at the wrong moment. We may panic. We may go into paralysis and depression, which are sort of freeze responses when faced with really anxious things. Sometimes when I get really anxious, it's almost like my body freezes up and I don't want to even move. Um, and I can't think of what to do next. So there is, there's too much, and then there is irrational or inappropriate fear. And this is the sort of thing that we deal with in the therapy world and the medical world of panic attacks, phobias, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, and post-traumatic stress disorder. So um, in the movie, The Aviator, you see an extreme example of someone who is obsessive about cleanliness um, and, uh, and, and uh, washing many, many times a day unnecessarily in his situation. And we see many veterans coming back from war situations with post-traumatic stress disorder. So those are examples of irrational fears, and I'm not gonna talk so much about those today, although I'll mention them again towards the end. But in all of our anxieties, I think there are common struggles. There is an overestimation of danger. I, I notice all the things that I have to do that may be difficult and dangerous. And um, when we were coming over here from the States, I was thinking about all the risks of flying when actually, when, I, when we got there, it wasn't nearly as bad. When we got on the plane and through the airports, there weren't actually many people there. We often underestimate our resources when we're, when we're doing something. So we get worried and panicked. We tend to worry more about the future and the past. And this takes all our energy out of the present. If I'm always thinking about what's coming up, and, and the things that have gone wrong in the past, uh, it's hard to focus on the present. Another theme, and this is especially true with those of us who are more perfectionist in our thinking, is the difficulty of living with uncertainty. And of course, we're living in very uncertain times now. And we, so we all get a taste of what it's like for people with OCD all of the time. They live with that level of uncertainty and far more very often. And worry feels like control. As someone has said, worry is a bit like sitting in a rocking chair 
It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. So, but it feels like you're somehow controlling something if you worry more. And then what we feed grows. So we develop habits of the mind, grooves in our brains. If we tend to worry, worry, and be anxious, then it just makes it harder to get out of that habit of mind and heart, because that's what they become. And of course, we also get the physiological aspects of anxiety, which come upon us almost through no choice of our own. They just seem to invade our lives and affect our thinking. So how do we cope with fear and worry and anxiety? Well, some people have too little. Literally, they, they, they can sail around the world single-handed um, through the icebergs and the fog of the Southern Oceans, or they can climb rocks like this one without ropes, or uh, they only feel alive when they're in the air floating down um, without a parachute. <laughs> and then, so some feel very little, and literally some actually have no anxiety at all. Um, some are more sensitive than others. And this, of course, is a product of our genes, of our amygdala, the sort of smoke detector in the brain for danger. And often when, I'm, when we're working with kids and teenagers, we, we call the amygdala Amy, that somehow you have to befriend Amy and get to know Amy and how she responds in your, mind, in your head. And then temperament, different people are born with different temperaments, childhood experiences. You know, if you've experienced a lot of trauma in childhood, it probably makes you more vulnerable to, it might make you more resilient, but often it makes you more vulnerable to trauma in the future or the present. How your parents deal with anxiety, how they speak about it, whether they keep telling you, oh, don't do that, don't do that, it's much too dangerous. And then all of our adult experiences and how they may train our brains to think about how, how we can cope. So the practical application of this last bit in biblical terms, of course, is that some are timid, some are weak, but we are called to be patient with everybody. And some of us are the opposite and that we tend to be just idle. We need warning. But the, the general sort of encouragement of people who are not so strong, who feel more anxiety, I think, is, is seen here. So how do you deal with anxiety and worry and fear? Do you escape, as many of us do, into work, obsessive working, alcohol, maybe video games, um, sex, Netflix, TV, drugs, sleeping pills, obsessive exercise? So many of us find ways to, and, and these in smaller quantities, obviously, can be helpful, like exercise is a very helpful thing. And, and having some break by playing a video game occasionally is not a bad thing, but it's when you typically develop a, a way of escaping, this becomes your, your only way out. Or do you avoid anxiety producing situations and just run away from them? So people who are socially phobic um, might decide I'm not going to spend much time with people. They love COVID because they can be at home and don't have to talk to many people because it helps them to avoid. And the question is, do these work? Well, as I've said, in the short run, they may, but in the long run, they're not actually very helpful ways of dealing with it. So as we turn to the Bible to ask, is there any wisdom on it? Well, of course, there is a whole lot of wisdom from beginning to end. And we see something of the beginning of anxiety and fear and depression and murderous rage in the story of, in Genesis 1 to 3 and beyond of a, a perfect creation and then a fall because of mankind's sin and rebellion against God. And then we see examples of fear particularly strong fear in a man of God who had had this amazing victory with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And then when Jezebel threatens his life, he runs into the desert about 200 miles and hides in a cave. 
uh, and the Lord has to come and minister it to him in various ways to help him out of that fearful state. Or we think perhaps another example of Hannah longing to have a child and her anguish and depression there described in 1 Samuel 1. These are strong emotions. And, and Proverbs says, fear the Lord, but don't fear. Um, in other words, if you really fear the Lord and believe that he is the sovereign Lord over the universe, then you won't need to fear so much in the other areas of life. It's a matter of perspective. Jeremiah asks, where are your roots? You know, are they by the water? And so when the storms of life come, you are nourished? Or are they in the desert where you're just a sort of dried up old stump that may be blown away or uprooted by the storms that come? And then perhaps the, be the, the place we turn to the most for comfort in anxiety is to the Psalms. David and the other writers, and I've given you more in, your no in the notes on this, um, so many examples of David crying out to the Lord in fear and trembling in Psalm 55. He says, oh, that I had the wings like a dove and I would fly away and be away from this anxiety. Or in 37, don't fret, trust, be still before the Lord. Cast your burden on the Lord in Psalm 55. God is our refuge, be still. And then in Psalm 91, we, believe, we, we, um, we are told that he will deliver us. You will not fear the terror that walks at night, the pestilence, the, um, the destruction. And we have to ask at this point, you know, what does Psalm, how do we take a psalm like that? Because does it mean that God will deliver us from all evil? What are, are our expectations? And again, we have to see Psalm 91 in the context of all the other psalms and the whole of Scripture, because it's obvious that God does allow people to, uh, to, to struggle in these ways. And if you think of um, the list of men and women of faith in Hebrews uh, 11, uh, so it, it sort of goes through a list of some were delivered from the mouths of lions, some had their dead brought back to life, and then without a break, it says, some were sawn in two. They wandered in the desert. Um, and, and it's almost like sometimes God delivers you and sometimes he doesn't. And we have to trust him even in the midst of that. So in scripture, we, we have this picture, I think, of the many stories of men and women who were anxious of the reality of anxiety. And we're given clues for the cure of it. And we see with Jesus that even he, uh, in, in his humanity, offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Even he felt anxiety. And Jesus taught us, don't worry, so much in the Sermon on the Mount here, but you know, he's saying a father cares for the birds and the flowers, and how much more? for you. And we have to ask how much should we care and take thought and be anxious? There is legitimate anxiety for what we eat tomorrow and what clothes we put on. That's taking anxious, reasonable anxious thought, but it's not obsessing about it and worrying ourselves to distraction with it. And the Sermon on the Mount suggests that where your treasure is, there will your heart, there will your emotions be also. If your treasure is in the stock market uh, and the stock market crashes, then you will be very anxious and probably very depressed. So the Sermon on the Mount it reveals our idols, it reveals our priorities, it tests them. So, and, and it also reminds us that that Faith and belief and trust in God, a sovereign Lord of the universe, even though we may not understand what he's up to, we have to trust that he is ultimately in control of everything. So that is the challenge there, I think, in the Sermon on the Mount. And if we look at Paul, 
you know, he was, he was anxious a number of times when his friend Epaphroditus was sick and dying. And, and he heard that he was recovering and was relieved so that he could have less anxiety. He, was, he had conflicts and fears about the persecution he experienced. He faced the daily pressure of his concern, his anxiety for all the churches. He says, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. And maybe his anxiety about public speaking, we're not quite sure what that was, but uh, he certainly experienced anxiety. And his remedy here in Philippians 4 is to, uh, to pray, um, to, so it, it, it says always rejoice, and then goes on, don't be anxious about anything. But then it doesn't just stop there and say, don't do it, just stop it. It says there are other things you can do to put in its place. So prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, uh, whatever's true, honorable, and lovely, I would put that in the category of Christian positive thinking. And then practicing what we see our fellow believers doing, like Paul, and trust. For it says right in that passage, the Lord is at hand. He's near you. And, and it repeats the peace of God, and then the God of peace will be with you. So it's almost like if you do these things, subjectively, you will know more of God's presence with you. And this is... You know, Paul, in a way, he, he didn't invent this, but cognitive therapy that we use today has been around for ages. And this is what Paul is doing here. You know, you have a situation, the, the a, this is the ABC of cognitive therapy. You, you lose your keys when you're just about to go out to take your children to school or get to work. And you catastrophize. You think, oh, my boss will be so angry or the kids will... Miss, a, miss school and the teacher will be angry with them. And those who tend to think in all or nothing terms tend to do this catastrophizing more. So you feel anxious, you feel sad, you feel afraid. And the, this is the constantly emotional consequence. And so what uh, cognitive behavioral therapy teaches you is to dispute, what am I saying to myself? Is it true? Um, what evidence is there for this belief? And as you begin to see that actually it's not as bad as you imagined, then you begin, it changes your mute mood again. And I think this is what Paul is doing. It's what David's doing in the Psalms, reminding us of truth and reality. Another thing I think we can do is, is practice gratitude. It's become all the rage in secular circles. But it, of course, it's been there in our own Christian thinking for thousands of years. Give thanks in, not necessarily for, all circumstances. And have your mind transformed by the word of God, by the people of God, by your relationship with the Lord. So we, 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 ask, a, we ask here, how would you comfort someone who has a dear parent in ICU with with COVID? How would you comfort a believer in, say, in the Sudan, who's threatened daily with starvation and rape and torture and death and is very afraid? That's, you can't give them platitudes, can you? You can listen, you can hear their fear, but ultimately, I think in these situations, we're pressed back to very foundational principles of that come out in, particularly in Romans 8, with the, in relation to the ultimate threat of death. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall, what, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For none of these things, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers. And so we, we think again of the men and women of faith in Hebrews 11, 
some who were delivered from the mouths of lions and some who went through death, persecution and death. And this is our ultimate hope that this is not the end. There is more beyond this and God will be with us as we go through those awful situations. Another biblical principle, of course, is resisting the evil one, the reality that there is, a, a, there is spiritual warfare. And daily we need to remind ourselves, and some days when life feels very oppressive and dark, I literally pray through the different parts of the armor and, and imagine myself putting them on and what each of them means. Another thing I think is incredibly important is friendships and community. You know, we carry, we are called to carry each other's burdens. Yes, we each carry our own little backpack, but when it comes to someone carrying a suitcase or a huge load on their back, we enter into it with them and help them to carry it. So, and here I come to this idea of common grace remedies. By this, I mean things that secular people acknowledge are helpful with anxiety that, are, that fit well within biblical truth, even though they may not be mentioned in scripture. So it's really important when we're anxious to have a strong relationship. So the therapeutic relationship in counseling or pastoring is to help people to feel seen and heard and safe and to enter into the curiosity with them of recognizing that they are anxious, so naming it, accepting it, investigating it, and noting it. One person has called this the RAIN principle, the R-A-I-N. Just sort of, it's so that you sort of make friends with anxiety. You get to know it. You don't always treat it as an alien, an enemy, as something to be fought. And, and particularly with children, we help them to make friends with, with their anxiety. We, we encourage people to approach their anxiety and their fear, not avoid it. So you reward courage. You can't really get through fears without facing them and walking through them. And in that you learn, I can't control everything. There are some things I can and I need to get on and do those. Some things I have to leave to the Lord or leave to circumstances. I have to learn to live with uncertainty because there is no certainty in this life. Practical things that affect the body, breathing, deep breathing, especially a deep, long expiration of breath, uh, is, calms the parasympathetic nervous system. And, and so this is, again, something I often use in and if I can't get to sleep at night or wake in the middle of the night, and I often wake up and think, well, I, I only remember taking a couple of breaths and then I was gone. Muscle re relaxation, learning to relax every group of muscles through the body. We teach most of our psychotherapy clients this. Uh, avoiding cats. Uh, and this is someone else's phrase, avoiding caffeine, alcohol, tobacco and sugar. I think the tobacco should probably more be nicotine, the stimulant. But, um, and, and so there are practical things like getting exercise. Exercise is a hugely helpful thing for anxiety and depression. Eating healthy food, not junk food. The list goes on. Having some sort of routine and predictability in your life. I think a number of people have found that helpful in COVID times. Getting involved with art and music and acting and dancing and sport and yoga. All of these things are, are really helpful in integrating our body and our brain. I've mentioned safe relationships. Some, some therapists uh, in, encourage clients to write down their anxieties and put them in a box or a pot or basket and just bring them out maybe one a day and spend 10 minutes praying, thinking through that anxiety, rather than trying to deal with the whole lot all at once um, and, and getting overwhelmed by it. Identifying linked emotions of things like anger can often be behind anxiety. If you're afraid of getting angry, 
either that you'll explode uh, or that someone else will explode at you, then you often repress it, but it, it leaks out in different ways in the tension in your body. Learning to work against repetitive thinking, uh, examining ways in which you, there's some advantage in being anxious. Some people can't give up their anxiety. Saying no to overload. Uh, I learned that the hard way in life. And it's, you know, many people get into burnout that way. Developing good sleep habits, not isolating oneself. Getting out into nature for walks. And I love bird watching and uh, identifying trees and plants. And, and, and having the discipline, and, and sometimes it is a discipline when you're feeling particularly oppressed to have to, at least two positive thoughts a day, or at least two things to be thankful for. And then in all of this, of course, one is praying, listening to sermons. I, I find Tim Keller's sermons recently on anxiety and COVID times particularly helpful. And I gave a reference to those in the notes and worship. And for some people who have very strong anxiety or depression, they may need a medical examination and, and medication may be particularly helpful. The medical examination to rule out things like a thyroid disorder or anemia or something like that. So as we come to the end here, some people experience anxiety more intensely and need specific therapy. And we have a a whole lot of specific therapies for what we call pathological anxiety, but we don't have time to go into those today. So I, I finish here with reminding you the biblical reminders that we have to write on our mirrors, <laughs> carry with us, uh, memorize. Um, I, I read just the other day that that verse in Isaiah 41, do not fear I am with you, is one of the most uh, referenced verses in the last year on some web Bible website uh, that people are turning to. So cast all your anxieties on him and he will, he promises to be with us and to help us in all of this. So let me finish there. And Peter, if you wanna come in and if there are questions, Thank you very much, Richard. We've been, if you've joined us while we've been going on, we've been listening to Dr. Richard Winter speaking to us on coping with anxiety in a dangerous world. And, and thanks, uh, Richard, for an incredibly comprehensive talk and deeply biblical and practical as well. Now we're moving into a time of question and answer. So if you've got questions for Dr. Winter, if you can type them into the Q&A box along the bottom of your screen. That's Q&A and not chat. And you can upvote other people's questions as well. So do keep those uh, coming in. So uh, from uh, Linnaeus Hewis from uh, Indonesia, he says, uh, do you think anxiety is inversely proportional to faith or whether anxiety is more of a habit that we can train when we deal with uncertainties? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Linnaeus. Um, I think it. Uh, I guess my gut response to this is it's both. Um, it, it you're you're touching on on truth in both areas because I think, you know, the more we do have faith, the more we're able to trust that God really is in control. Um, that our it does reduce our anxiety. It doesn't take it away completely, and so the second part is that it can become a habit or it may have become a habit partly because of our temperament, partly because of anxious experiences we've had in childhood, maybe uh, think really bad things that have happened to us in our families that, that uh, cultivate anxiety. And with those, you know, as much faith as you have, you still need to work at training your mind, your brain, your body, to deal with the uncertainties and the anxieties that you've learned. So I would say it's a, it's a bit of both. Thank you. From uh, Roshan Carroll, who's a dentist in Nepal. Uh, thank you, I appreciate your presentation and the common grace remedies in particular. 
but a specific question on yoga. Do you think practicing yoga is acceptable for followers of Christ? As my understanding is that it is a Hindu spiritual practice. Another great question, Roshan. You're, you're challenging me here because this is obviously a, not an uncommon question when I mention yoga, especially for those of you from, uh, from India or Nepal. And um, I, my own understanding of this is, and I, and I have practiced yoga, in fact, I do practice yoga, but I, I, I'm only really practicing the physical aspects of it. And I think it is possible. I believe it is possible to do it without getting involved with the thinking practices. A number of my friends who do it are humanists or into Eastern spirituality, and they very much get involved with the thinking of, uh, of, of alternative Eastern spirituality. And I, I don't think it's necessary, it is necessary for one to to do that, I think it can be a purely physical uh, activity that that is very helpful for stretching and relaxing um, the body. So I think there's overlap here between a Christian view and a, maybe a Hindu view, where there is common ground that we've discovered that these practices are helpful to relax our bodies. But I know that's that's controversial area. Thank you. From, from Paul Hudson, Richard Paul is uh, medical director at SIM, uh, Big Mission Society. Uh, do we as medical practitioners, including missionaries, are, are we more prone to perfectionism? And uh, if so, why is that? Well, um, well, Paul, I, I don't know whether um, <clears throat> all missionary medical practitioners are more prone to perfectionism. I know some who, who aren't, but I do think, I mean, I, I've written about a book about perfectionism, so I have thought about it and studied it a bit. And part of the reason that I wrote was that I saw many Christians struggling with the, the bad, of, bad parts of perfectionism, because perfectionism is a two-sided thing. You know, the desire for high standards and excellence is a wonderful thing. But the negative side of perfectionism, where you demand too much of yourself and you're over conscientious. But I think as Christians, in a way, we, we are called to, um, to, to high standards and to conscientiousness. So um, that is so it's both cultivated within a Christian, within the church, but it's also something that more conscientious people maybe are attracted to medicine, uh, perhaps too to being missionaries because they have a heart for others um, in a way that, that non, less perfectionist people do. So it's an interesting thought uh, and I'm rambling a bit on that one, but uh, recommend my book, I guess. <laughs> and we'll okay. send out, uh, we'll send out these book links when we write to you after the after the webinar. Um, Peter Keelman, uh, GP in Scotland, CMF UK member. A very helpful thanks, Richard. How can we as Christians respond to the tsunamis of anxiety and other mental health issues that we're seeing from the pandemic, especially those in doctors and other healthcare workers? So Peter's coming from background of not just a general practice, but as a CBT therapist like yourself. Yeah. Gosh, Peter, you, you could probably answer that better than I can. You know, you've, you've got more experience of that uh, now working, you know, as a GB, as a GP. Um, I, I, I guess all I can say is that I think, you know, taking, it depends if someone is a Christian, obviously we can have common ground with them in talking about Christian principles as well as the more what I've called the common grace remedies. Um, I, th I think the, the, the sort of basic, the most basic thing, of course, is, is really listening well to people and hearing them and, um, and, and people knowing that there are others who are struggling with this anxiety too and uh, helping them not to feel ashamed when they're anxious 
and, and sort of normalizing the anxiety helps, I think, to bring it down. Um, and then if, you know, if they need extra counseling help, then using some of those common grace remedies, teaching them breathing exercises, whatever. But it's something that we're all involved in and um, we can't escape the anxiety. Um, I think, so, so it's, yeah, I, I, I think that's all I want to say on that. Thank you. We're, we're certainly bringing out the psychiatrist today, Richard. Our next question is <laughs> from, from Dr. Nick Land, who's a past chairman of CMF UK and a consultant psychiatrist, but now in full-time Christian ministry. So he's saying, thank you, very helpful. Some Christian leaders are very reluctant to admit to anxiety. And I wonder if you could just comment a bit more uh, about your slide on Paul's <laughs> anxiety. Uh, in a bit more detail, as he's a great role model on uh, God working with weakness and God's strength being made perfect in weakness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think what I was trying to bring out in that was just, as you've said, Nick, um, the reality that Paul is not ashamed to admit his trembling, his fear. Um, and so many Christian leaders, as you say, uh, feel they have to have it all together feel that they should never show weakness, um, never show tears, never show, never talk about anxiety. And I think that's, you know, Paul is not saying that at all. And it's a completely wrong, I think leaders can model an appropriate vulnerability, talking about their struggles and talking about maybe how they, how they approach them, how they deal with them. Um, and I think that's what Paul does in the in the passages that I mentioned and in, in others that we haven't mentioned. So you make a great point there. Um, I think Christian leaders need to be more open about depression, anxiety, struggles with anger, struggles with sexuality, whatever it is. They don't need to tell everyone all the intimate details of their lives, but just to show that they are real human beings. Paul, such a massive encouragement, isn't he? And, and particularly yeah. as you were quoting 2 Corinthians, he really opens up his, his heart and lets us see his struggles uh, in a way that uh, I personally find so encouraging. I'm sure so many others do too. We've got an yeah. anonymous question here. Um, a great question. Is it possible <clears throat> if we feel anxiety in our gut or heart or, or uh, other places, uh, to not know specifically what the trigger for it is and and how can we understand our anxiety better if if all we feel is uh you know the somatic or bodily sensations without really understanding the the thoughts that have triggered it i think that's yeah that's a great question good question yes um yeah i mean we do that does happen <laughs> Um, and it is sometimes we don't know what it's about. Um, and I think it's, you know, the whole of our lives, I guess, we spend learning about ourselves and how to read our bodies and read our emotions. Um, and especially for people who have grown up in environments where they haven't been encouraged to talk about, you know, fear and anxiety and anger. So I think one of the greatest things a parent can do with a, ch a child is when they're upset, is help them to put words to what it is that they are feeling and, uh, and thinking. Um, whether it's sadness, whether it's anger, whether it's anxiety, and to give them permission to feel those things and then help them to deal with them in more appropriate, healthy ways. So, um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, just learning to talk about, it may be necessary to go to a counselor um, to, to get help with identifying the, the physical aspects of, um, and there are some counselors now who focus a lot on the body, so-called somatic therapists, um, and help people to put words to what it is they're experiencing in their bodies and to identify the places that that may have come from, perhaps in earlier life, maybe traumatic events that have happened that they've never been able to 
they've barely been able to remember or even name that are sort of lodged somewhere in their in their body. Thank you, uh, Ken Lim, uh, another psychiatrist. Uh, thank you for a rich and useful presentation, uh, Dr. Winter. Regarding linked emotions, is forgiveness a remedy for suppressed anger? Uh, that's so hard to do. Uh, would you have any words of wisdom on that? Yeah, yeah an another great question, Ken. Uh, absolutely, it is. Um, forgiveness is a remedy. Um, for obviously for suppressed anger, but you need to know what you're forgiving before you can forgive. There's an awful lot of shallow, cheap forgiveness around. And, and I think it's really important to, to help, to go deep into the reasons for the anger and to be able to name what you're angry about and the consequences of it so that you know when it comes to forgiveness what you're doing. So it's a process that you enter into with deep angers uh, experiences of anger, a process that may take time, may take, you know, months to actually come to a full understanding of what forgiveness means in that. Um, so, and, and as I said earlier on, anger, you know, suppressed anger often comes out as anxiety, so that, that may be the first thing you're having to deal with. Thank you. From Frida Angelia. Uh, does or can anxiety affect how we hear or perceive God's voice? And in particular, how can we tell the difference between an anxiety, a faith mixture of perception and, and real Holy Spirit leading? Uh, can God work through our anxieties to, you hinted at, to prompt us about things we need to deal with, for example? Wow, that's a, that's a, a, a good, and difficult question, Frida. Um, you know, as I, as I wake up in the middle of the night, anxious about what I have to do the next day or what's coming around the corner in my life, is this just my fears and my faithlessness and my sin, or is it God actually speaking to me in that and leading me to make a list of what I should do? Um, I'm, I'm honestly, uh, that, that's a tricky one. And I think for each person, they have to discern themselves and maybe talking with um, someone, a pastor, a counselor, a friend about it to, to make that discernment. Because it, it, sometimes it's a bit of both, isn't it? That we are dealing with at the same time. Now here's a, a slightly cheeky question. Richard, an anonymous question, but a new anxiety which has overtaken many of us is the whole experience of Zoom calls and meetings, especially when you're presenting and your connection's dodgy or you can't share your screen, etc. <laughs> what have, helps you to cope? Uh, that's a genuine question and uh, quite funny because we did have a little bit of teething challenges, didn't we, right at the beginning today? Yeah. There's, there's nothing that gets my anxiety going, like technolo technological problems when I'm giving a presentation <laughs> with them. Um, and I've learned that over the years, this was before the era of Zoom, but even just doing PowerPoints in lectures in, in places I'd never been to before, uh, to get there in very good time, <laughs> to run through it and check the equipment and everything. And, and especially when I was giving lectures on perfectionism, it seemed to happen more often. Something would go wrong. <laughs> um, and I had to learn to deal with imperfection. And I guess it's just sort of, again, partly normalizing the fact that we're not perfect and we don't get everything right. And, even our equipment and machinery doesn't work perfectly all the time. And being able to laugh at ourselves and and all of that. It's it's so often, isn't it, if we're giving a talk on something that we get personally tested on it in the days leading up to it, in yeah. the sense that we learn the, the same lessons. Very common experience. From um, Tim <clears throat> Tusink now, uh, please comment on your experience with the utility of Christian meditation techniques, such as using Lectio Divina or others 
to deal with anxiety? You've touched a bit on this. Yes. Um, I think, I think a, a number of these are really helpful. I think a lot of it is, you know, learning um, to slow down and to breathe and to uh, allow one's mind. And this is, I've done some teaching on, on mindfulness. Um, and obviously this is related, uh, is a form of Christian meditation you, where actually learning to slow down and just observing what is going on in your body to start with. Because most of us race through life and we um, are always busy. Uh, our minds are always going. And it, it's really hard discipline. At least I find it because that's who I am. I tend to have a busy mind. It's hard to slow down and just to breathe, to, to the simplest exercise is to watch your breath <laughs> or to eat a, you know, a piece of fruit, a raspberry, uh, and to eat it slowly and taste every little bit of it and to smell it before you eat it. And to, so to, to eat it mindfully, to go for a walk in the woods and to smell the air and the earth and the leaves and uh, look at everything around you. Um, that, that is being mindful. So it's a form in a way of Christian meditation or about the world that God has given us, the creation around us. And I think it slows our bodies, the breathing calms our parasympathetic nervous system. And then if we introduce biblical passages to meditate on, uh, and maybe a, a word or a phrase or a verse to go over in our minds. And I don't think it should be a completely contentless meditation, um, but something that has some content that, and, and, um, and I think this too can be really helpful. Um, so it's a, it's a whole nother world of meditative slowing, whole nother, in a sense, another area of spirituality that Protestants have been slow to get into, um, but I think are doing so more and more now, recognizing there's common ground with some Eastern techniques and some maybe some Roman Catholic techniques, uh, areas of spirituality that Protestants are not used to. Thank you very much. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. There's lots of questions still rolling in. And we've been listening to Dr. Richard Winter talking about coping with anxiety in a dangerous world. So it just uh, remains to me to thank uh, Dr. Winter again uh, for coming and sharing with us your, your wisdom. We're incredibly grateful to you uh, to speaking to us on this subject. And uh, we hope we see you again sometime on ICMDA webinars and to all of you who've come and listened today, uh, we, uh, we thank you for your questions and for your attentiveness and may the Lord bless you uh, as you go forward uh, to serve him. Thank you very much. God bless you all.